Welcome to the Football Pod. My name is Konstantin Eckner, and please welcome with me my co-host, Abel Mezard. Hi, and uh, our guest today is probably the second most famous Norwegian in football, uh, depending on how you feel about Erling Haaland and some other players, of course. But he is somebody who wants to save Eintracht Frankfurt from relegation and is really, really famous in Germany and now around Europe as well. And currently, um, he is a TV analyst and pundit on various channels in, in, in Germany and Norway and all over Europe, who give, is giving us the latest takes on uh, football. And we invited uh, him to talk about his home country, uh, the talents coming from the Great North. So I hope you enjoy our discussion with the one and only Jana Gefjortov. Jan, thanks for being with us today. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, football fans know you from your various roles. I mean, you're, you're on German TV, you're on English-speaking TV and international TV, you're, of course, in Norway, um, you're on Twitter, you're an outspoken, let's say, personality in football and expert. Um, so I wanted to ask you before we start uh, talking about Norwegian football, uh, when you look back at recent times, recent months, has there been anything you, you said uh, online or somewhere where you think like, well, there was a hot take that didn't play out? Oh, well, I guess all the time, but I think that it's a, that it's a part of a part of being the role that I have, that I try to be as knowledgeable as I, I can. Uh, and firstly, I, I, I run my own communication company in Norway, so I have to look after that company as well. But when, when there is always something happening in football, so distra distracted of that, but still love to be in there. But of course, when you have a, a lot of opinions, uh, some, some is not good or some are not, not bad, but I have the... <laughs> I have the skill that I don't care if I am the only one in the world who have an opinion. If I, if I, I I'm 100% sure of that opinion. And, and I, I think that we had an analyze of uh, RB Leipzig against Manchester United. And um, I think it was 1-0 at halftime. And I, I said that Manchester United couldn't play like that because they just played it. They played more like a reaction, more than an action. And a big club like Manchester United couldn't play like that. And then they, of course, won 5-0. Uh, and afterwards, there were a lot of people said, yeah, Manchester United should play like that. And I said, no, I don't think so. Yes, they won 5-0, but Manchester United should improve their own play and not only play on the mistakes of the, of the clubs. But, but I guess that is a part of being on TV or in the media. You have to have opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm also uh, on TV and uh, you always get these kind of questions where you, like, you kind of have to be willing to look silly from time to time but I mean I, the, the Man United point is, is a good one because I, I know a lot of Man U fans who are happy with the the results sometimes but maybe not like the actual style that they're playing and, and I agree with you um, in that sense and I, like I want to ask you more a little bit about Norwegian football because um, obviously this is a, a really really good time for it um, maybe maybe even probably the best time since since maybe when you were playing or, or in the 90s right that, that's a I have some some memories. I'm sure you you have obviously better memories because you you were you were there. But um, and there's two players that we want to talk about, and, and the first one is Erling Holland. And I know you uh, you've talked a lot about him. Obviously, um, can you share with us like your meeting of him or like how sort of your relationship with him started or, or what it's like? I mean, you you have a, a great special insight into. Well, first of all, it's a great day to talk about Norwegian football because as we speak, Molde beat Hoffenheim and knocked Hoffenheim out of the European Europa League, which was an enormous achievement of a Norwegian club out of season. But yeah, now Erling Holland, uh, as you know, uh, I played with his father. Uh, yeah. And then uh, it's then I remember when we met, um, not coincidentally, but we met in Augsburg before his first game. And I, I said to Erlang, we, I, was, I was working there and he was going there to support him as his father and his uh, agent and advisor. So I said to, to Alfie, we, we just now need to define our roles. Remember, when I asked you about Erling, then I asked you as a journalist, when, when, but we're still friends. So we just have to find out the balance. <laughs> and what, what has impressed me with Erling and by, by meeting him, by interviewing him, is that that is his attitude. And I think that is very underestimated um, how he has done his way to develop himself. It's, he's always on development. And just, just last week, when he scored two goals against Sevilla, had a fantastic game against a very strong Sevilla team, 
and he scored two brilliant goals and and whatever or one involved in goals and and then still managed after the whole world kind of is after him the media want to talk to him on everything and he still managed to concentrate and do so well against Schalke and scoring that fantastic goal of course and and I think that is imp- impressed me at most because in many terms he is a normal 20 year old with all the problems and challenges and 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 no limits attitude that you have as a 20 year old but still he is very mature in terms of his attitude and sometimes that 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 gets out when people just see him in him in an interview but that's just the way he is. He's 20 years of age. And, and when you ask him a question, you, you sure don't want to go for a yes or no question because he will always ask for a yes or no answer. So, so he, he is a good lad and, and he is um, so far so good. There is no big, big cars yet. There are no big, big tattoos and there are no big, big boobs uh, that some, some football <laughs> players go for, go for quite early. So, yeah, so it's, it's very, it's very, it's both interesting and quite inspiring to follow his career because I think Norway never had um, uh, uh, a player on that level before in, in the whole history of the football uh, in Norway. Yeah, that's a good point because I wanted to ask you about about him and his his personality. Um, as you said, like for a 20-year-old, he looks appears to be far mature than many 20, 19-year-old football players, uh, who especially when they have their big first contract, you know, and there are the rumors out there, they might be sold or might be uh, transferred for a huge sum, which is, of course, happening right now with Erling. Um, at least there are rumors. And of, even if players say they don't read these rumors, of course, they know about it and they hear about it. Um, and I wanted to ask you, like, uh, from your knowledge about him and his situation, who are the people who are helping him? Is it his, only his father or the other people? Or does he have, like, a, you know, a group of, of guys who are advising him, so to say? I mean, advising might be the wrong word, but um, where does it come from? Because I, I, I think, I, I assume there are people who are helping him to be where he, at, where he is right now. Yes, first of all, there's his dad, who uh, I mean, knows the business. He played in England, played for Norway, plays for Forest, Nottingham Forest, Leeds United and Manchester City. He's been there, done it. So he can help him to, to kind of get in everything into perspective. And then Alfie, Alfie his, his dad, uh, and his family background from where he's from, they're very bodenständig. The people that are, they are, they are calm people uh, anyway from that region. And, and Erling is a part of that as well. And then Alfie has been very good to to kind of get people in and around him. He, he, the, what you see from Erling when he tries to improve his football game, that's what Alfie tries to do with a team in and around him. So he will use, he will use when it comes to finances, he will, he will use one or another teammate of ours who, who, plays, who played in England who is now in a bank uh, and he, there, there will be friends who work in the business industry. Then, of course, uh, he got to Raiola. Uh, who helps him with uh, with the uh, with the big transfers kind of decisions? Uh, one of the most uh, prolific uh, agents in the world, and he will have his people. Raiola will have his people with with different uh, communication people would help him on that terms, and so so he has a very good team around him. And and then there is Erling himself, who kind of have the, the the right attitude to always improve, to always look for places to get a percentage better. And I think that is also uh, the the key to the team uh, in and around him. Yeah, that's that's something I wanted to ask you about because, like, um, I think it was a little bit over a year ago when on Constantine and I were were talking, and I ended up writing a, a, a scouting report on on Erling Holland, who at that time, I mean, not a lot of people knew, and this is maybe like January of last year. Um, I mean, certainly people knew him of, 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 who, of who he was, but not in terms of performance. And, and one of the things I wasn't sure is, is, you know, how will it translate? And obviously we know how it translated into uh, the world footballing stage. But I was looking at some of his characteristics and, and like, what do you think? Because you, you know him probably better than, than I do. Is What's something that people don't notice about his game? Because I think, you know, people notice the finishing. People notice his sort of like, you know, the, the tub tum tor, the, the sort of drive to go, to score. But what's the, like an underrated part of his game that you can address? Great creating spaces. That is his, uh, he is the best player I've seen. Uh, I'm not sure that I've seen a better player doing that. Uh, and and that I, I saw him live abroad for the first time when he came on against Liverpool. And, and against mm-hmm. Liverpool, he could have scored four. And he was on for some yeah. minutes. He scored one. But he created spaces against the best defender in the world, Van Dijk. 
And the way he kind of create the spaces that he wants to take advantage of, it's unbelievable. And just, just follow his game. He creates that space on himself. And then there is an underline to that point. He never goes in offside. That is yeah. unbelievable because he always plays on the shoulder of every defender. And he always uh, find that space, create that space, or find that space that he creates himself. It is unbelievable. This lad never goes in offside. Uh, the way well, he plays... What do you think because it's, it's, it's a, yeah, I think that is the, the two two points got to do with each other. Because if you create your own space, then you kind of uh, the, a consequence of that is also the timing. Of course, it helps to have great players who place the ball at the right time. And if you see when Allen gets frustrated in some games, when you see his body yeah, language is going, that is the moment when Brandt or Royce or Sancho don't play the ball. <laughs> Uh, exactly when he wants it yeah. to play, because in, in that in that terms he is very mature, uh, and and I and I think that is one of the reasons he will develop into a leader. Uh, and I have already said that he's twenty. I, I think he should be the captain of the Norwegian national team because we are a we are a middle of that now that the, the new generation comes into our team and the old ones are getting out. And I think that he will develop into a leader because he, he is so brilliant in reading the game, not only reading where the ball will end or or use the right tool because that is a key to a goal getter is to when when to shoot hard when to lift the ball when to chip the ball when to kind of use the inside of your foot but the way he creates space is is just unbelievable now it seems like you know basically my my notes on my uh, little sheet of paper here because the next thing i wanted to ask you that was on my my paper was about your comment that he might or should be the the captain of the national team right now and not like in five or five years or so because people might expect that in terms of his age um and you said that he should be now the, the captain and the leader of the young guns of the of norwegian football and Erling is one, of course, I mean, he's an outstanding talent, but you have seen other nations where there might be one outstanding talent, like Wales with Ryan Giggs back in the day. Um, but in, in Norway, it's a little bit different. Erling might be the most high-profile player right now uh, coming from Norway, but there are others, there are other young players, as you said, like the, the group of young guns. Why, why is that? Why, why is there such a surge of, of talent right now in, in 2020, 2021? Well, I think that the small countries, as you said, Wales, Switzerland, Austria, Norway, and, and sometimes Sweden as well, although they have been had a lot of players over the years, but, but still you're so depending on your generations. And somehow the generation kind of inspire each other. So if, if, if someone takes the next step, someone follows after. So that is an underestimated uh, thing. And at the moment, we, we, we don't have anyone... Uh, at Erling's class, because that is something to do with his temperament, how far he has come. But as you said, we had we have Martin Odegaard, we have uh, Ayer who's playing for Celtic, we have Sander Berger, and, and so on and so on. So we have a lot of young kids coming through. The problem with the Nor Norwegian national team is that we don't have a great balance in the team. So, so I always say when people are getting over optimistic about our national team, I always say it's not like... It's not like one goal Holland score in the Champions League makes another centre half. We don't have centre halves. We don't have a, a right back, left back. We don't have competition on those places. But uh, you are depending on these players. And and what I what I said is that the optimistic around the national team now. We got a new coach, Stolle Solbakken, who you remember from Köln, and he always in Copenhagen for many many years with a with a success in Copenhagen. But now there is a, is a new start, and I think that it would be a great great signal because being a national Captain, the captain of your country. I've been there for 15 years, 15 times. Been very honored to be my captain. But it, that is not a job you do on a daily basis. That's what you do when you are home. Uh, the main thing is to have the the flag when you go out and you talk to to the other captain. But still, it's a great signal, I think, when you now have a new generation that you uh, you kind of have to choose the leader of that those young guns. And 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 he is that. And Aling is that because. There are different kind of leaders, and he is that leading by example, leading by his body language, leading what he demands from the players in and around him. It took him like two minutes against Augsburg to change the whole Dortmund game. And, uh, and I think that is a skill we need in a national team. So it's, it's interesting because like listening to you talk, it, it sounds like this, is, this change is happening more organically, this sort of new age of Norwegian football. And I wanted to, I mean, just wanted to ask if, there, I mean, there is like a planned element to it because, you know, many countries will, will like 
you know, for example, I'm, I'm living in a country in Hungary where, where there's a lot of planned development of, of you know, um, putting money into football and expecting some, some good results and, you know, whether or not successful, it's, it's beyond the point. But um, what's sort of the Norwegian story in, in that sense? Is it, is it just more that there is a generation of players? Because like from, from, what I, from what I've seen, it's not like there's a lot of like centralized development or, you know, it's not like it's always just one club because you see um, what Molde are doing or Bodo Glimt are doing and there's always these players are coming out. Like what, what do you see as the, the key driving force behind it or who? Well, the, well, the sad thing about developing players, it takes time. It can take a generation. Even in a big football nation like England, it took some time because they came up with a golden generation now. And, and coincidentally, maybe that was to get a lot of these young players to Germany to, to kind of, and we see Bellingham and other going the same route as, as they've done. Uh, and, and in Norway, now it's a good point. We, we're not centralized it, but, uh, but the Football Association will play a role in terms of getting more and more pitches, Norway is a very long country. That means yeah. that we are we have North Norway, we have South Norway, we are, and we have developed unbelievable lot of pitches. There are pitches all over Norway. They have been very good at using astroturf. I am very against astroturf on the first time level because I think that changed. Yeah. Well, isn't isn't nearly another game, but 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 on on the on the kids uh, with the kids is great because then they can play. The, the, the whole year around uh, and, and on, on others is also that a lot of sports people in Norway and, and it's quite interesting a lot of them are sons of daughters of former athletes and yeah. that is uh, a thing that should be underestimated and, and like Alfie is a good example he comes from England and, and his, his, his son will have that, that then in the DNA or what he's going to do but, so there's a lot of small uh, coincidences there's also the, the football associations have got um, uh, putting more resources into to the youth national team so they can play more football games. So when you're ending up in the under-21 games, maybe you have played 20, 30, 40 games against Netherlands or Hungary or Austria or Germany, uh, things like that. So it's a lot of small things that add up to what we have at the moment. But the problem is, as I said, there is, there is not a much balance. There was a time where we, we made a lot of centre-halves and then we kind of said we have to look for the for the attackers, and then suddenly you don't have attackers, and then you have no center half. So that is the problem being a country of only five million people. And that brings me to another um, point. Um, I mean, people might not know the entire history of Norwegian football, but to, to maybe sum it up, there were there was a golden time. Let's say it in the in the nineteen thirties. Um, with Jürgen Ruwe and others, and I think the bronze medal at, at the Olympic Games. But between the 1930s and, let's say, the 1990s, there wasn't much going on uh, in terms of international success. I mean, of course, there were a few players here and there, but the national team didn't do anything. And there were, then there were the two World Cups in, in 94 and 98, where, where, um, for which Norway qualified. And I, I guess that was considered like a new quote-unquote golden generation, if you want to call it like that. Um, of course, with players like yourself, like uh, Henning Berg, like uh, Tora Andri Flo and so on. Uh, and, and a little bit later than John Carew, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer uh, in, in the 2000s um, as well. So if you compare your generation, 90s, early 2000s, uh, with today's generation, not only in terms of like where, where the players play and which, on which position, but also just in terms of like quality, attitude and all, all in all, right? What, what would you say? Like, is it comparable to back then or is it a different generation all in all? Well, first of all, it was good summarized of you of the Norwegian football history because when we in the 1990s, in the beginning of 1990s, we, we start with a, with, a, with a new qualification. Since we were always last in our groups and we had some, some good, good and get great results, beat England in 81 and things like that. But but it didn't. It, we'd never have the consistency. And well, to to your question, which is a great question, and I I worked as a, a as the manager for the Norwegian national team for a couple of three years, and I and I, I remember when I introduced myself to these young players at that time, and I said to them, um, uh, I'm from a generation where we used to qualify for World Cups. Uh, the good news is that you guys are more talented. Uh, now you just have to make sure that you have the attitude, the hunger to get better. Uh, so I think that it was two key elements. And but what I like now with the with Holland, with Martin Odegaard, Sander Bergen, Aya, they got a great 
they got a great uh, attitude. They want to get better all the time. That, that we did as well. Uh, Erling Holland is an exception because Erling Holland is, is further than any other Norwegian football players have ever done. But what we were good at in the 90s was his hunger to get better. And we, we knew that to get better, the, the guy next to me got to get better. And we were desperate to do well, desperate to develop. And we need more players like that. As, as you said, we, we had a... And, and also, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I've been pointing at that a couple of times now, is the balance in the team. Because at that time, we had old players like, or older players like Bruno Bratze, who was the captain from Werder Bremen. We had Eric Torst, but it was a bit older than the rest of us. He, he was playing for Tottenham. Uh, and then you had a, a, a kind of some guys like myself, Chet Lerekdal, as, as you know, from Hertha Berlin, uh, and yeah. players like that in the middle. And then we had a, 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 the, 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 what we call the 69 generation in Norway, because that was a great guy. It was Stig Ingebjörn with Liverpool, Lars Bohin and Henning Berg, as you said. We were a lot of players, Ronnie Johnson, who later came mm -hmm. uh, in and around that generation. So the balance was very, very good. So, And that, that was a good way of influencing each other. And uh, so we... we I think that in a small country, I, I always said that you said in the 1930s, and, and yes, we, we got a third, uh, we got a bronze medal at the Olympics. But when we started off in the 90s, they were not sitting in the TV studio and saying that everything was better in the 30s. <laughs> but with, with, with all generations now, they get, always get compared with my generation. And when I, when I can sit in the studio and we can have a, a joke about it, I will always say to these people, how many World Cups have you played? When I, when I speak to Jon Arne Ries, who played for Liverpool, okay, you won the Champions League, but how many times did you go to World Cup with a national team? So, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's also getting tougher to, to get in there because a lot of the, the smaller teams get better organized. Uh, they, got, they know, and, and, and I have to say that sometimes, I think a lot of national teams learn from the Norwegians in the 90s because we were very good organized. And it's... Is one what start is the organization start and then you get individual players or is it the individual players creating that organization and uh, so uh, so I will say that there's still a good way to go but with Erling Holland that's why I say that the signal is so good to make him a leader of that pack. Yeah, it was great listening to talk about those things because it, it sort of brought back some of those memories. Like I I, I was. I was around for, for the 94 and 98 World Cups, and I remember those, those matches, like, like the Brazil one, I think. Is, is, yeah, is, of is, course. Is, 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 that's the one that I think everybody brings up. But um, I wanted to ask you about Martin Odegaard, because I think there is a, an interpretation of his career where, you know, he was supposed to be the golden boy, right? Like who has been around for, it's now seven years where he's been in sort of the, the public eye and, and, and the, the debut with Sturm Gotthard and then Real Madrid. and and. I think there's an interesting, I mean, I, I personally really, really enjoy watching him play because he's a completely unique player who just wants the ball and wants to have solutions. And, you know, there's a lot of guys in football who, you know, like to hide necessarily. And to me, he's always showing, he's always trying to, and I, I love watching players like that. But um, I want to ask your opinion about what you think of his career uh, path and, and sort of where it is now and, and you know, how, how, he's, how he's come along. I mean, I, I mean, as much as you can share. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, Martin Odegaard, it's, it's, it, I think it's first, it's in, uh, first of all, I think you described his uh, <clears throat> playing ability is good. But it's also important to, to remember he's, he's still 22. Uh, yeah. And if you compare with Erling Holland, who kind of take every step so quick, uh, that is nearly unfair to do. Uh, yeah, and uh, 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 Martin Odegaard, at the time when he went out, uh, the best place he could go was Real Madrid because they had the best second team. He could play on that level. The coach of that team was Zinedine Zidane, which is not bad to have him as a as a role model when you are a, uh, when you are a, a midfielder. And and then he had as a lot of other players. Uh, people say, well, he should go to Ajax straight away, but but it's not. Si I'm not sure that he would have played at Ajax when he was 16. Not a lot of 16 year old do that. So then he went to Holland a couple of seasons, uh, and, and especially the last season, he was very good in Holland. Very good, yeah. Then, yeah, then they took him back, and, 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 and then he went to Real Sociedad uh, before his injuries, was one, one of the best midfielders in, in La Liga. And then maybe the big, big decision was then for Real Madrid to take him back, and maybe he wasn't ready, maybe his injury took him uh, a bit. But what he's doing now is that 
there is two decisions you could make. Should he stay on at, at the Real Madrid, try to get it, games for Real Madrid, or should he think? Would he would he think to himself that uh, that Arsenal could be the chance? Arteta loves the way I play. He has talked to Guardiola. He wanted, was desperate to get me when I was sixteen. So I think I understand that was tempting. But I think what what Erling Naya, what uh, Martin Odegaard now lacks is that that temperament. Uh, yeah, I want him. I always says to says to him. Uh, give me a call when you have knocked someone down in training. I, I, w- I would like to see more of that uh, thing, that temperament in his game, in his personality. He is a fantastic young lad. He's got a great attitude as well. But I think you lack that kind of thing because the, the English always say you need to have a present on the pitch. You have to be a present. You have to be there. And there are games that he, like you say, look for the solution, looks for the, for the ball all the time, never hides. But sometimes you would love him to be more present on the pitch. And uh, we'll see. Uh, uh, like I said, he's 22. There was a lot of, of the biggest stars in football. They, were, they weren't even at that level when they were 22. So it's going to be very interesting to follow his uh, development at Arsenal or wherever he will, will end up. The only, uh, uh, but just at the end, it's also say that Real Madrid has, have not been good at developing young players. And they have the same with Luka Jovic. Um, very promising young kid as a, a striker, and and they they've seemed to have a problem with that. Of course, it, it's it's tough to play with one of the best clubs in in the world, but but still, I think that for, for them to kind of be attractive for the young players, they need to improve that area area. Yes, to to me finish that segment um, because the the career path of uh, Martin Udegaard got me thinking in a way. Um, I mean, you you can argue if it was the right move to. As you said, I'm, it might have been the right move to, to go to Real Madrid. It might have been the right move to just stay a few more years where he was. Who knows? I mean, that's like it, it, there's never a right or wrong, in my opinion. Uh, but there's a di- difference to Jens Peter Hauger, who's another. You, you, you talked about a couple of the, the younger uh, Norwegian talents like Sander Berger, and Jens Peter Hauger is also one. Um, and he waited for a little bit longer. And I mean, he, he showed up at us AC Milan, I think, a few days before he turned 21. So it's a different career path. Um, but I think there's like less pressure on him. Maybe it's a little, there's less expectation now uh, compared to Martin Odegaard, where everyone was thinking, "Ah, oh, there, there was the guy who had all the hype behind him." Um, but I wanted to ask you about Jens Peter Hauger. Like, I, mean, I guess you are for, or I expect you to follow him also very closely. Uh, what do you make of him and his career now at Milan and where he is and his performances? Is he maybe some, someone who might even like take the Martin Odegaard spot in a way in Norway because, you know, a little bit different career path, maybe different mentality also. Uh, that's, yeah, I wanted to get, have your two cents on him. No, but I'm not sure that Jens Peter Hauge was more patient. I mean, he, he, he was just another path. I mean, three, four years ago, he wasn't good enough for a third division team in Norway. And then and he kind of came out of nothing uh, based on the development of Woody Glimt and based on the development on himself. So, so I don't think you different career path it's, it's hard to to um, uh, to uh, compare them but as you said it, it's a good way to start because you're a challenger you're a bit unknown in a in a in a slowly now very good AC Milan team uh, uh, he got other attributes I like the way he takes on people I like his attitude I like the way that he plays the same way as for Milan as he did in Norway and he just take on people scoring in the European Europa Cup and things like that so I think that is a brilliant time for him to come to Milan because they need to, to get the teams younger. They need to have young kids like him. And this is a big chance for him. But as, as you see now, he's not involved in the European Cup. Yeah, there are some games now for a while. He hasn't been out. Uh, he's been out of the team, out of the squad. So I think that it's very important for football players to be patient because you just have to wait for your chance, wait for your chance. And people around you will, will have a pressure on you. You have to produce all the time. But it's all about that patience. And I think that is a key. If you're a Martin Erdegaard who goes another path or you, you go Jens Pet- uh, uh, Hauge that suddenly uh, is in AC Milan play, uh, after playing for Budigrim. So the patience is the key here to every football career. Yeah, right. I, was, uh, I, mean, I, I do a lot of the Europa League. So I was, I was uh, disappointed not to, not to see him after how, how good he was in a couple of those games, like in the Slavia and, and the group matches. But, um, you know, the, the whole time we were talking about Edegaard and, 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 and talking with you, we have to ask the question about 
your 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 future and and what you will be doing. I mean, I, I, if I'm reading between the lines, I think uh, you're trying to get Martin Odegaard to Eintracht Frankfurt. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but but uh, is there is there uh, something in line for you in terms of you know management? I you know not not you know not necessarily at Frankfurt, although. They might be they might be uh, looking for somebody uh, in, in terms of replacing Freddy Bobic if he leaves. And obviously, it's a great time to be a Frankfurt uh, fan and supporter. But can you talk a little bit about your your plans? Well, first of all, uh, with Freddy Bobic, I think maybe they have the best uh, head of sport that you can have in Germany and, and one of the best in Europe. Uh, now, I I decided uh, when when I finished my career that I I didn't want to go into coaching. I didn't want to go into uh, management that's what I said but I still did my coaching badge because I think it was a fine way to to kind of uh, get a system uh, to systemize what I've learned throughout my career so that was good then I was tempted by Lillestrom who is my club in Norway to be management so I did that next to being a host in the Champions League shows uh, and I was manager there I was also manager for the for the Norwegian national team because I love my national team I love my country I know my football country so that was good to be back uh, doing that. But now, no ambitions in terms of management, no ambitions in terms of coaches. I always turned, uh, the, the, not that for the last years, but I, I had different options earlier to, to go. Now, I, I love the way I, I'm involved in football. I'm involved in football like I want to uh, be involved in football. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm running my own communication company in Norway. I, well, Outside COVID, I have a possibility to travel a lot uh, when I when I will, I when I can, and and now I do uh, TV for for three different channels uh, in 2021, and so that is it's a good way to to live football, and and I always say when I when I see some of my colleagues in Germany, and I that is my generation, I always say they're getting fatter and they're losing their hair, they're getting grayer, so. I think I'm I'm happy in this position so far. Although I I I am getting faster as well. So so uh, so now so I I I I will stick to my role. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's what what great talking to you. Um, I mean, what you just said got me thinking. Also, uh, we we talked about uh, the 1930s in Norway, and and Jürgen Juve was uh, Juve was was one of the tr uh, great strikers at the time, and he was also working as a journalist on the side while he was still a striker and scoring goals left and right. Yeah, was, I did. I, yeah. I think he was working for Dagbladet uh, um, as as a sports writer. So uh, that's yeah. There, there's some. I think there's you know you're in line basically as a but as I a think, former striker. I think there was a story about Jürgen Juve because, of course, when he worked in in Dagbladet, and there were other then in, in other papers. So I think there was a game when he scored three, four, or five goals. I don't remember. But still, as many as possible for a good story. But then, and then the other journalists wrote, uh, but that was all he did, <laughs> scoring yeah, yeah, four four a... goals. <laughs> uh, I think that was a quote from him. <laughs> Very one, yeah. I, I would have loved yeah. you to comment on uh, or you know back in the day when you had the chance to maybe comment on your own goal you, you <laughs> scored for Eintracht Frankfurt when you saved them from relegation <laughs> basically <you know. laughs> at that time at that time we have had some great journalists who did that on the radio and that is uh, that was uh, I think that was a better description than I would have done I would probably lost my voice I guess <laughs> I mean that's how I grew up in Germany you know I, I watched the Bundesliga highlights of the two, of the early 2000s or, or late 1990s because at DSF at the time uh, they, they always broadcasted the highlights of previous seasons and like you know your, your your crazy step over before you scored the goal I was like I think that they showed that a thousand times <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's and that's, that's, that's why good when I worked in when in Germany, because then they called me their Übersteiger. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, but, but it was a good goal. And I always said that if I didn't score it, if I, if I tried to do what I did and didn't score, I would probably never go back to Germany anymore. But now that, that goal in, in 1999, making me a great connection to German football and to Eintracht Frankfurt. And I'm a very proud uh, market, market uh, Botschafter, so ambassador for the club with some great, great players. And I always say that, when I, when I speak to the big players, they, they have trophies from the Champions League, from the Liga, and I have a nicht abstieg trophy. Uh, so that is the only, that's the only trophy I took with me from, from abroad. But no, great, no, no, great no. memories. And, and I think that is, that is what it's all about. It's all about memories uh, uh, of football that you take with you. And every day there are new memories and new results. And that's what we love about football. Absolutely. So, Jan, thank you for your time. Um, if you want to... You know, if people want to find you, they can find you, of course, on Twitter. You are Jan 
you said it's Jan Orge, but it's Jan Arge with a, do a double A, Jan Arge Fjotoft, uh, at Jan Arge Fjotoft on Twitter. Um, and also people can find you on a television screen near them somewhere, you know, ESPN, Sky, and of course in, <laughs> in, in, in the region uh, television via play. Um, so Abel is at BundesPL and I am CC underscore Eckner. Again, Jan, thank you for your time. Pleasure to be on. Thank and you. If, you, so if you want to support uh, our podcast, you can visit patreon.com at the football pod. And for now, we are out. <laughs>